to me, it's like learning what are all the potential options that are out there and then being able to identify which are the ones that are going to be highest yield for me. What am I going to be able to take advantage of that's going to enable me to earn the most amount of points for the least amount of like time or energy or effort in just the most interesting way for me. Hey there points people. You just heard a clip from Devin Gimbel from Point Me to First Class. Devin is the founder of Point Me to First Class, which assists employed professionals, entrepreneurs, and business owners to earn credit card points and travel luxuriously. She focuses on how you can use your expenses to your advantage. And Devin's aim is to transform first class travel and help women travel more, travel better, and travel more often using credit card points. In this episode, we discuss how high income earners can effectively leverage points and miles to travel. We discuss the barriers that prevent people from getting into the points game, strategies for earning points sustainably, and how to prioritize your time and resources. Devin and I also discuss how to maximize your credit card rewards beyond just the sign up bonuses by taking advantage of category bonuses and non bonus category spend. If you want to maximize your credit card rewards, consider the Chase Inc. Business Cash Card, which earns five points per dollar on internet, cable, phone, and office supply store purchases. Remember, Remember, if you decide to apply for the Chase Inc. Business Cash or any other card, never apply directly through Google. Always use a friend or creator's referral link. And if you're interested in supporting this show when you apply for your next card, check out geobreeztravel.com slash cards. And if you're not sure what card is right for you, I offer free credit card consultations at geobreeztravel.com slash consultations. And we have links to the Chase Inc. Business Cash and free consultation form for you in the show notes as well. And now on with the show. Welcome to the GeoBreeze Travel Podcast, a show for anyone wanting to level up their travel hacking lifestyle. I'm your host, Julia Menez. I'm a travel hacker, coach, speaker, Filipina American ENTJ who loves solid travel gear and using shortcuts on spreadsheets. On this show, I'm on a mission to bring you travel hackers from all walks of life to help you level up your travel hacking game. We dive into credit cards, miles, points, strategy, mindset, and the secrets behind how to travel the world for next to no cost. So let's get hacking. Hey, Devin, welcome to the Geo Race Travel Podcast. Hey, Julia, thank you so much for having me here. I'm so excited to have you here, and I'm really excited to talk about the money topics that we are going to talk about today, which is how do you think about points and miles if you're a high income earner or just high spender, but you can actually afford it and it's within your budget? Because a lot of the points content out there is how to live a champagne lifestyle while you're on a Budweiser budget or something like that. But for those, who do have higher incomes or maybe a business that has high revenue and high expenses, I'd love to delve in a little bit today about how, how they manage those things and how they think about money and kind of what's within the matrix and what's outside of the matrix there. Before we get into all of that, tell us a little bit about you and your background and how you got into points and miles. So my name is Devin. I think I'm a fairly ordinary person. Like I live in the sub suburbs of Chicago. I have a family. I'm a physician, but I no longer practice medicine. And I think my story is really typical, honestly, for a lot of people. I've always had this just lifelong, deep love and interest in travel, but didn't have access to travel a lot growing up. And as I got older with the boom of the internet, so I, you probably can't you can't tell for the people who are listening because you can't see me. I'm 42 years old. So I grew up in the pre-digital age. We did not have internet when I was very young and growing up. And that has obviously changed a lot. And so with all of the internet resources and access that we have to learning things, started a personal finance education journey, which quickly led into the rabbit holes <laughs> of points travel. And so it really opened up this whole world to me of literally the world. How can I see more of the world, do it sometimes in ways that are a little bit more comfortable than I had been used to traveling for a lot of my childhood and early adult life. And as with many of us who listen to this podcast, just continue to learn more, practice more. And now that I no longer practice medicine, teaching other people really how to leverage their expenses, which can be significant to earn points and miles and then use those points and miles to travel has become kind of my new purpose and my new passion. What drove that decision to leave medicine to pursue teaching points and miles? Because yeah. a lot of people, when they think about medicine, they're like, wow, that's a very lucrative career. And you have to pour so much of yourself into that to even get credentials and to get yeah. your medical license. And then when you think about content creating, people are like, hey. There's a lot of starving artists out there. So how did yeah, you decide to make that, that transition? That is such a, a good question. And I tell people a lot of times when I was going through, I mean, literally that decades long process, right? <laughs> of like learning and preparing for med school, going through med school, residency and fellowship is that I didn't actually go into medicine thinking, oh, I know what I'm going to do when I grow up. Like 
I'm going to help people learn about points and miles. I actually did go into medicine out, out of this deep love and desire to serve people in that way and really assumed I would have a very traditional career where I would work full time until I was 65 and then had access to my retirement accounts and then maybe would do the retirement thing. And I have to say, I didn't leave medicine to do what I'm doing now. I mean, both of those things happened, but they were not completely connected. I had practiced medicine for about seven years after I had finished all of my training. And even though that sounds like a short amount of time, a lot changed, honestly, not only in medicine, but my very particular field of subspecialty, which is very small in the area where I was practicing in the country, a lot of things changed really significantly over that time. And I just became really, really unhappy in the practice. And I, of course, thought about a lot of alternatives and tried a lot of things to make it work. And ultimately, I just came to a place where I was so unhappy. It wasn't worth it for me personally to stay in medicine. And so it was a really, really hard decision because, like I said, I thought I was going to practice forever and I wanted to. I just couldn't continue kind of in the environment that honestly is a lot of what our healthcare system is now. And so I ended up leaving medical practice in the end of 2019, of course, having no idea what 2020 was going to hold for the world and for everyone. And so it did end up being fortuitous in the sense that obviously so many things, right, got impacted um, by the pandemic. And for me, it was very good because it allowed me to be at home during a time that I think was really important for me to be in my home when so many things were changing. And so it wasn't this one-to-one -one transition of decide to leave medicine and then the next okay. day jump into doing what I'm doing now. It yeah. was actually this growth and evolution kind of over this two or three year period where I'd been doing all the points travel for myself and my family for many, many years. And then kind of coming out of the pandemic was starting to see, wow, I know so many people in medicine and so many business owners who could be leveraging this so much better than they are that it was really just like an organic growth of just having one-on-one -on -one conversations to then creating a Facebook group that people ended up joining and then building that into a business. And so it's something that grew over time that I really had no idea was going to happen in the way that it happened when I did make that decision to step away from medicine. For everyone in your network who is a high income earner, a business owner, what are some of the roadblocks to getting into points and miles? Because Obviously, most of us who listen to this podcast know, yeah, you can earn tons of points if you have the spend to back it up. What do you think are the main trepidations that people have from getting yeah. into the game? Yeah, I think honestly, one huge initial barrier is just that you don't know what you don't know, right? And when you think about, again, kind of the main groups of people that I work with, it's like, especially with physicians, they have been head down working for literally 20, 30 years, right? So once you get through all the training and then you get into practice, most people are still working really, really hard, right? Like really long hours, really unpredictable schedules. And so even though they may love travel, it's not like they're just sitting around thinking like, oh, what like new thing can I learn on the internet? Or what don't I know about travel? It's you get into this routine, right, of just your life. You're working really hard or you have a family outside of work. And so I think so many people that I work with, their initial barriers, they just don't know. Like they don't know that this is a possibility. And I think that there is still so much lack of information just around personal finance in general that I think a lot of myths are perpetuated, like myths about whether having more than one credit card is irresponsible to begin with, right? Or myths about whether or not using credit cards and earning points and using them to travel is some sort of scam, right? And I think that there are so many people who, especially if you come from a, a background where you were not really financially resourced like I was, there's so much misinformation, I think, just around personal finance and, and financial responsibility to begin with that I think a lot of us who consider ourselves to be very financially cautious, like we don't want to jump into something that sounds like crazy or too good to be true. And I think that when you don't really know a lot about points and miles, it can sound too good to be true. And I think a lot of people interpret that then as saying, oh, there must be something dangerous about it. And I don't want to get involved in something that's going to be really dangerous. And so I think that for so many of the people I work with, it's not the barrier of how can you earn the points once you understand how it works. It's that initial, well, I don't even know about it or I hear about it, but this seems a little scammy. So I don't even want to learn more. And once people surpass that barrier, then really the sky is the limit. Like when, when you have high spend, I tell people all the time, it's like, 
you're literally sitting on a gold mine, right? You just have to learn how to tap into it. How are the strategies different for somebody who is a fully credentialed doctor making hundreds of thousands of dollars a year versus a resident who's making $40,000 a year and sitting on a large pile of student loans? How should they approach points and miles differently? Yeah, I, I actually think the strategy, parts of the strategy are the same, but then there are some really, really big differences. So I will say that when I was a resident, I had no clue about this whole world. Like I said, I, I grew up raised by a single mom. We didn't have a lot of financial resources. And I was very much taught growing up that credit cards are dangerous, right? That if you get a credit card, you're going to go into debt. Um, you may not be able to pay it off. Therefore, emergencies only. And so when I was in training, I didn't have a credit card. I mean, part of the benefit and I say this as someone who's been in like multiple different income brackets of when you have no money, there's not a lot of decisions to be made about money, right? And so when you have no money, I, I didn't need a credit card. I, no, I didn't have any money to spend or pay it off. And I went to medical school completely on student loans. And so when I was in residency, my income was going towards living expenses and paying my student loans. And I, like I said, I didn't know anything about rewards, credit cards, and didn't have a credit card at all. And I think now residents are becoming much more financially savvy than when I was in that position. But I think when your income is sort of in that trainee level, like you said, where it might be 40 or $50,000 a year, which is a great income, but maybe a lot of that money is going towards expenses is that's when I think it does make a lot of sense to really be relying on signup bonuses to earn a lot of points and to be very strategic about getting cards that have either low or no annual fees, but still allow you to earn points. I think those are really important considerations. One of the things that I started to experience when I really started learning about this, which for me was after that period when I was in training. And so I was already starting to make a little bit more of my like grown up income, but still had a lot of student loan debt to pay off and things that I was trying to save money for is I started to realize very quickly that if you do have the luxury of having high expenses, whether they're personal or business, at a certain point, you cannot just rely on sign up bonuses, right? Because you exhaust them. There are literally not enough credit cards that you can apply for fast enough if that is your only way of earning points. And even for the professionals and the business owners that I work with who are comfortable holding and managing multiple credit cards, a lot of them don't want 70, right? Like they may be fine having five or maybe up to 10 credit cards, but at a certain point, they need to have alternate methods of being able to sustainably earn a decent number of points that doesn't require them to try to constantly be getting multiple new credit cards a month just because that's what their expenses can actually support. And so things like bonus categories, right, on specific credit cards becomes much more important and becoming really strategic about how people want to allocate spend. So, you know, when you do have the luxury of high expenses, you can start thinking about things like, is there an airline or a hotel program where status really matters to me, where I'm willing to allocate a certain amount of spend so that I can get high globalist status or I can get top tier status in American Airlines or United Airlines or whatever the case may be. And so I think those are some of the things that come into play when you just do have more expenses that you can put towards things to earn you points. And I think that's really interesting because for anybody who is making $40,000 a year and they're like, man, if I were spending hundreds of thousand dollars a year, I would just keep churning through cards. I would keep getting sign up bonuses. I'd have millions of points because every time I spent a dollar, I'd earn 20 points because there would be a new sign up bonus every single day. Let's talk about how that is not the reality. And for people who are earning a lot of money, a lot of them are working a lot or consultants or business owners and their attention is just not on earning sign up bonuses. It's on running a business and or doing their vice president of whatever job. Talk about how the attention kind of shifts for a lot of people who you work with in this high income bracket. I think when it comes to points and miles, I, I don't care what your income is. I don't care what your expenses are. I think we all have the kind of the same general approach of looking at what are my resources that I have to put into this game and how can I maximize those? And your resources can be things, obviously, like your expenses. If you have very high expenses, that is a huge resource. If you don't have high expenses or you don't have high income, maybe you have time, right? Or maybe you have the energy or the interest to do a lot of self-education online, on YouTube, learning from people who are posting all of these amazing things. And so everyone has some resources they can tap into. And so what I see is just that different people have different resources that they're able to tap into in order to 
do what they want to do with points and miles. And so kind of at the level where, like you said, a business owner who is running a multiple seven figure business and doesn't want to be putting in the time to apply for a new credit card every single month or every two weeks. Well, what they have is then let's look at what is their biggest resource? Like what are the biggest categories of spend that we can really leverage to earn tons of coins? So I have one private client who runs a very successful multiple seven figure online coaching practice, and she spends over $400,000 a year on social media ad spend for her business. And so one of the things that we want to do is say, okay, what are the cards that make the most sense for you so that you can really optimize that particular category of spend, but that's not going to require you, again, to be switching out your credit card every month because for the people who manage your business finances, they don't want to get an email every two weeks that there's a new credit card for social media ad spend, right? Like they want to have the one or the two credit cards. And so I think it really comes down to first just identifying what are the resources I have available to me that I want to put into this hobby? And then what does it look like for me to really maximize those particular resources? And if somebody does have a lot of ad spend, the answer is Amex Business Gold. 4X points on ads, they usually don't have a set limit on it because they know a lot of people are spending a gazillion dollars on ad spend. So if you are in this camp where you're like, I spend half a million dollars on ads every year, get yourself the Amex Business Gold. I think it's also maybe like an unpopular opinion, but if you do not have money or time, maybe points isn't the best way to allocate all of your energy. There's probably something else going on in your life where you need to find a different job that doesn't take up all of your time and doesn't pay you enough because it's taking up all of your time and not giving you any resources. So how would you think about prioritizing time, attention, energy, money, if you're just like, I feel depleted on all of those buckets? Yeah, I think that's such a great point. And if you are in a situation where you do, you honestly do feel depleted in all of those. You're like, I have nothing in any of those buckets. Then I think it's a great question to ask of then like, okay, well then is this the thing that right now is the right, is this right for me? And is it right for me right now? Right? Because the answer doesn't have to be yes. You can have tell people all the time that despite how much I love points and I love teaching people about points, you can have a completely amazing and fulfilling life without ever earning credit card points or ever using them to book travel, right? Like this is not a life or death situation. And so I think what happens actually is that people kind of self-select in or out. Like I don't actually meet a lot of people who are dying to learn about this and are also saying, but I have zero time and I don't have the willingness to learn this or, and I don't have expenses that are really going to then allow me to easily earn points without having to do 27 different points earning strategies. And so I actually don't get confronted with that question very often because most of the time I have found that if someone is aware of kind of this world of points travel and they want to get into it, they almost always have some resource that they can tap into and knowing that resource can change over time. Like when I first started learning about this, I was married, but I didn't have kids. And so for me, this was the really fun kind of break from work. Like when I needed to have a break from having like stared at cases and worked for four hours straight and I just wanted a 15 minute break, this was a wonderful thing for me to be able to go online and read about one specific credit card or one specific sweet spot. And for me, that was nine years ago. Now I have two little kids and my time looks very different than it did when I first started doing this hobby. And so I don't leverage my time in the same exact way but I've also had the benefit over that period of time of my husband starting a business and me starting a business. So now we have the benefit of having additional business expenses as resources to leverage. And so I think it's possible too for people who have a certain set of resources at one point to understand, well, in five years, that may look very different from me. And I may have additional resources to leverage at that time. That is a great point as well, is that it is okay to change, first of all, because some people, especially anybody with an internet presence feels the need to put themselves in a bucket and be like, I am the budget traveler. I am 20 years old and we are staying in hostels and we are eating $1 burritos every day of our lives. And then suddenly your channel takes off. It is 12 years later. You are not 20 years old anymore. You're 32 and you're still hanging on to this identity of we are doing budget travel. We are in hostels. We are eating $1 burritos. I'm going to hide the fact from people that I'm actually making it out okay right now because I have to hang on to this identity. And for anybody listening to this, it is okay for your identity to change and you don't have to just pigeonhole yourself into a thing because that's what you presented yourself as to the internet. That's completely fine. Yeah. And just your travel can change, right? Like I remember 
when I first started doing kind of a lot of travel on my own, I took time off in between when I finished college and when I started medical school, precisely because I did want to travel. And I knew I was never going to just get that much time, <laughs> or I figured I would never get that much time again in my life. And so I traveled, but in my early 20s, again, like I had no money. So I did the travel by any means necessary sort of approach to travel where it was like scrounge up any money I could find, book the cheapest economy flight to Southeast Asia and have a $10 budget a day, right? Where I was staying in places where it's like you have shared bathrooms and you pay $5 for a 16 hour bus ride from Thailand into Cambodia because you can't afford a flight. And that was amazing. I have so many incredible travel experiences and travel memories from that period in my life. And I wouldn't trade that for anything. And now, like I said, I'm 42. And if I sit in what an economy seat is now, which is different than what economy seats were like 20 years ago, my body hurts after four or five hours. And so when I was 22, I could fly from Boston to Vietnam and back in five days and be back in the hospital working an 80 hour work week. When I would do that, if that was my chance to travel, I can't do that now. I get jet lag when I come home from Florida. And so for me, travel now looks very different than it did 20 years ago. And that's okay. Both of them were amazing for really different reasons. Can you talk about how you made the transition to say like, it's okay to spend more money as I make a higher income because there's a lot of personal finance advice on the internet that's like, when you make more income or when you get a raise, don't inflate your lifestyle, just put all of it into investments. And I think that kind of save culture, while it does save a lot of people from themselves and helps people to avoid living beyond their means, at some point, it is okay to proportionally level up your lifestyle as long as you can afford it. Can you talk about, was that a hard transition for you coming from your background and residency and all of that to suddenly being like, we can afford to spend a little bit more? What's interesting is that when I think about kind of my, the travel I've done over the last 10 or 15 years compared to my travel budget is that I don't actually think my travel budget has gotten crazy. It's certainly more than $500 a year, which is what it used to be. But I think for me, that's one of the reasons that Points was so powerful when I learned about it is that I it opened up so many amazing travel opportunities for me that did not require me to spend a ton of extra money. And so I think this is one of the things that for people who kind of are in the financial situation where they do have a travel budget that they're willing to spend, maybe like an annual basis, that points are so incredible because it can just stretch that budget so much farther, right? Like if, if I did all my travel only with my cash travel budget, we would take probably like a fun family trip once a year to somewhere like really local and we would have a great time, right? But instead, I can take multiple trips a year and I can fly in a much higher class of service than I would ever be willing <laughs> to pay cash for. And so that is what points did for me. And I think from that sort of personal finance, like mindset, that question that you asked, I, I think that's really important. And I think that's very personal in the sense of, I think everybody has to kind of take all that information that's out there, right? Like, what are you being taught? Or what are you hearing? And passing it through the filter of like, what parts of this make sense to me? And what parts of this align with my values, right? Because when I was kind of learning about all of this stuff, I was educating myself about personal finance, because for the first time in my life, I actually did have money I could make decisions with, right? And those decisions were like, do I pay down student loans? How much should I pay them down? Should I put money towards retirement? How much should I put? What part of this is just for fun for me, right? Like how much of this can I actually just spend on things that make me happy without feeling guilty, without feeling like I'm ruining my future? And I think that those are very personal decisions that really come down to kind of your values and your goals. And so What's interesting is it was never really hard for me to begin to say, oh, I'm fine taking some of my disposable income and using it for a travel budget because that had always been something that I derived just so much joy and so much pleasure out of that was easy for me to see the value in putting some money there. But I think because I had points, it really also tapped on that really deep desire to get a great deal, <laughs> right? To say that, oh, but... It's not like I'm spending $100,000 in cash a year on travel. That is not my personal goal, my personal priority when there are other things I want to put my cash towards. And so I think a lot of it comes down to just understanding when you're making decisions about your money, are those decisions coming from something that someone who you don't know, like 
told you or said on the internet, right? Or are you making that decision because you've evaluated whatever you've heard and you've decided it actually applies for you and how you wanna live your life? If you're looking for even more next level ways to make the most out of your points and you're not sure how to do so, we do have a couple of options for you. The first one is through the GeoBreeze Travel Patreon, which you can access through patreon.com slash GeoBreeze Travel. Each month, we prepare a members-only video with personalized step-by-step -step tutorials based on the exact departure airports, destination airports, and points currencies our members request. We also host a group coaching session each month where we often have special topics and deep dives into different programs, and you can ask any questions that you have about earning points, redeeming points, credit cards, or anything else in the open forum group coaching. And we have a lot of people who join the $5 level just to say, hey, thank you for the free content on YouTube, Instagram, and the podcast, and I am forever appreciative of your support. And the second option is for business owners or individuals who spend more than $100,000 a year on expenses. If that's you, we would love to chat with you about our points portfolio management offer, where we can show you how to get some really incredible luxury travel with the amount of points that you can earn with that level of spend. You can book a free intro chat with us at geobreachtravel.com slash intro call. What about non-travel expenses as far as leveling up where you live or the clothes you wear or what you're eating or cars, clothes, any of those things? How has the mindset kind of shifted up to, well, there's not like a quick travel hack on all of these and I would like to have nicer sweaters. Like how does that kind of play into your personal finance mindset? Yeah, I'll just talk about me personally because I'm sure this answer is going to be different for everybody. But, and again, I think there's a lot of us who are in this, this hobby or this lifestyle because we fundamentally kind of love the puzzle. Like we love the puzzle of how can I take the money that I'm spending and turn it into something on the other side, right? Like how can I get the most amount of points like the least amount of either just like effort or agony on my part. Like there's a lot of points earning strategies I personally do not do because for me, I'm like, ooh, the effort or the time or the energy that would take doesn't appeal to me. But in terms of really being able to optimize my expenses, like I love that challenge. It feels like a puzzle to me and I like solving puzzles. And so this is where for me, two things have come in really, I think really heavily over the past couple of years. And as I mentioned before, one of them, is really those category bonuses for cards. And I think about the credit cards that have non-bonus spend as a category, right? And those cards become really important once you kind of hit a spend level, again, where it's like you are spending enough that you cannot keep up with sign-on bonuses. And so I think about what are the categories of expenses in my life where even having a card that earns me 1.5 times points for all non-bonus spend or two times points because of the nature of my spend is still a ton of points. And so for me, things like quarterly business taxes, I mean, if you can get one and a half times points for a huge business expense, then I'm all over it. And that doesn't sound sexy, but it adds up so much over time. And so for me, it's been about looking at what are those big areas of spend that either I wouldn't normally think I could use a credit card for, and can I figure out like how to use a credit card and is it worth it for me? And then the other thing is, I think especially over the last couple of years, the opportunities to earn just ridiculous numbers of points from online shopping portals has opened up. I either didn't really know about shopping portals five years ago, or they just weren't as good as they are now. But specifically, I'm thinking about Rakuten and the ability to earn American Express points. I earn hundreds of thousands of American Express points a year just because of online shopping through Rakuten. And I'm not spending hundreds of thousands of dollars online shopping through Rakuten. I think one of the things that you can do is you can really kind of time some of your spend. By, in terms of online shopping, Rakuten pretty consistently offers huge bonuses around holidays. And so if there are things that I don't need immediately, but I can kind of stock up on during those big bonus periods, I do that. So the last quarter of the year when Rakuten has huge bonuses, for holiday spend, I think about what do I need over the next year if I can stock up on it now and I can be earning 15 or 20 points on, on some of these expenses. And that has really allowed me, I think I calculated the other day, I think I was getting effectively for all my Rakuten spend over the last year, over 15 points per dollar spent. You don't need to be spending $100,000 on Rakuten to get a lot of points. But if you are spending a couple thousand dollars, you can earn tons of points that way. What are some other expense categories where people don't necessarily realize, especially business owners and people who are spending a lot of money, where they don't realize the potential for earning a ton of points for that particular expense? 
Yeah, this is now, unfortunately, not the case. And this is something that I think we see in this world that something that's an amazing ability to earn points, it's not forever, right? Like we see kind of trends that come and go, things you can earn points from that kind of eclipse or sunset. And this is on the personal side, but this is something that I was doing for about a year, which is unfortunately no longer valid. But I think that this is a great example of one of those things you don't necessarily think about earning points on, but I did earn a ton of points on it. So in the realm of kind of saving money and investing in financial priorities, like I mentioned, I have two kids and there are educational investment funds called 529 accounts where you can essentially put in money now for your young kids and it can grow. And then when they go off to college, when you take the money out, it has a different sort of tax protection than if you were just saving the money in a bank account or what have you. And there was a time where you could actually fund 529 accounts using rewards credit cards for no fee. And so there was a period of time where, you know, for parents who are putting hundreds or thousands of dollars a year into a kid's educational fund, if you can fund that using a credit card, you're going to make that investment anyway. But if you can turn that multi-thousand dollar investment into multiple thousands or tens of thousands of points, especially at no fee, I mean, that's a no-brainer to me. And so that's one kind of example of something that was fantastic and seems like it as of the last couple of weeks or months, isn't actually available anymore, which is disappointing. But this is the nature of the game, right? There are some amazing points earning opportunities that you take advantage of, and then they go away. And then something else comes along. So it's part of just the way that things change. And then in terms of the business side, I kind of reference this, but I think business owners who are paying estimated quarterly taxes, to be able to leverage those to earn credit card points, either as a great opportunity to earn a sign-on bonus, especially if it's a business credit card that requires really high spend for that initial period to get a sign-on bonus, or if it's a business credit card that, again, allows you to earn one and a half or two times points for non-bonus spend, if you're spending tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of dollars a year on quarterly estimated taxes, to be able to leverage that with a business credit card to earn tons of points, I mean, I can't tell you how many places in this world I've flown business class completely thanks to estimated quarterly tax payments. Like it is not to be underestimated the power of those. Especially if you're getting something like the Chase Inc. Business Preferred or the Amex Business Platinum, those sign-up bonuses can be like $15,000 of minimum spend. So that's an easy way to get 100,000 bonus points or something like that. And then if you are earning just one and a half or two points per dollar, what you want to make sure of is that you are not losing money because sometimes you have to pay the extra 3%. So it might make more sense to just pay the taxes out of your checking account if that's going to be a thing. So just make sure that you're not losing money on those. Another thing that I really love, if you do have a business account where you have to keep $100,000 liquid or something because you have inventory, you have purchase orders, you have to be paying out, you can store that money in a checking account with Basque Bank which is part of Texas Capital, and you can earn American Airlines miles instead of interest on your checking or savings accounts. So what that means is if you have $100,000 that's just parked there at any given time or it averages out to $100,000 a year, you can earn, I forgot exactly what their rates are. Let's say it's 1%, it's actually higher than that, but that's 100,000 points that you would earn with American Airlines just for letting your money sit in a checking or savings account like you would do anyway and running your business expenses and business payouts through that account. So that is another huge strategy for people who have a lot of money that they have to keep liquid. And I know everybody's like, oh, you should invest it in like the S&P and everything. But these businesses do have to keep a lot on hand liquid, especially with some businesses where like you're buying and selling a lot of things and a lot of inventory. Bask Bank is a great play. And doesn't require you to open more cards. I think that's fantastic. And then the other thing that just I was thinking about is for people thinking about what are some of these alternate opportunities or strategies where you can earn points is that there's a when you think about people, you know, and their kind of their financial priorities, one of the things that we talk about a lot is don't go opening up a bunch of credit cards if you anticipate wanting to apply for a mortgage when buying a home within the short term. And I think that makes a lot of sense for a lot of reasons, but there are programs that actually allow you to earn points when you do buy a home. What are some of your favorite ways to earn points on mortgages or home payments like that? So I know that there are ways, especially when, when you've already secured a mortgage to be able to pay your mortgage and leverage that to earn points. And this is a category of spend or category of points earning that exists that I don't personally take advantage of. So in the past, in order to pay your mortgage using a credit card, 
you normally had to go through some sort of like third party processing platform like Plastique or something like that. And then you could only use certain credit cards even through that processor. So I think right now to pay a mortgage, it's only MasterCards. And so there's a very limited number of points earning credit cards that you can use. And there is a fee to be able to do that as well. So that's an area that, again, just because of the effort and because of the potential risk for me, I've decided, oh, those are points that I'm not personally going to chase, but you can do that. For everybody who is renting, whether in a high cost of living or low cost of living area, there is, of course, the built card where you don't have to pay any fees and you can earn built points, use them for American Airlines, United, Hyatt. They've got Turkish miles to miles, a bunch of great partners. So that is a way to earn a lot of points if you are renting. Hopefully one of these days they get into the mortgage market as well, but it has historically been a bit harder to earn points through mortgage. Yeah, absolutely. Some of these points earning opportunities, like you mentioned, are very limited in terms of you know who can take advantage of them or how you can take advantage of them. And so again, kind of my perspective with points is that no one is ever going to take advantage of every single points earning opportunity, right? Like even if you do have high expenses or even if you do have the resource of having a ton of time, so you can resource all of these different things, research. So to me, it's like learning, well, what are all the potential options that are out there? And then being able to identify which are the ones that are going to be high yield for me, right? Like what am I going to be able to take advantage of that's going to enable me to earn the most amount of points for the least amount of like time or energy or effort in just the most interesting way for me possible because i know that there are some points earning strategies that other people really love where i'm like oh that just seems hard to me or that seems boring to me and vice versa there are things that i've done to earn points that other people are like i would never waste my time doing that but that's been really valuable to me so i think it's nice to know that this game is so broad that you don't have to do every single aspect of it in order to earn a good amount of points or in order to get a good return on your effort. Yeah, I was trying to think through what are some of my largest expenses that I'm putting on credit cards. For a lot of the work that we do at GeoBree is I pay contractors that we hire a lot of your guys' favorite people from the points community to record little videos for the course or the Patreon or something like that. And I pay out everybody, including my staff, through PayPal and I just have a credit card hooked to it on the back end. And if I do want to work on a sign up bonus, I can just switch out what card I'm using at any given time through PayPal. So that's another thing that you can do. Always just ask like, hey, can I pay you through PayPal if you want to do something like that? There is a little bit of a fee depending on the contract. Sometimes I pay it. Sometimes the person receiving will pay it. It depends on what exactly we're doing. But that's a way that I earn quite a few points. If you are a business owner and you have a lot of ad spend, then that Amex Business Gold is a really good one. If you have internet, phone, cable, then Chase Inc. Business Cash is a fantastic no annual fee card where you can earn five points per dollar. If you are a travel agent and you are booking flights for other people, you can get an Amex Business Platinum and earn five points per dollar doing that and then just invoice your client to have you um, be paid back. I know that Spencer and Ashley, who do a lot of Airbnb management up in Canada, they will just put everything on their cards when they're turning over a home to be turned into an Airbnb through their management company, and then they'll just invoice their clients. So they're earning a ton of points there as well. We've had Flips for Miles on the podcast, and he sells a lot of shoes through Amazon, either Adidas or Nike. So he's just scraping through Adidas.com and Nike.com, stacking it with Rakuten, earning millions of Amex points per year. And he was like, yeah, with everything I have to track through the inventory and everything that I'm selling on Amazon, I just don't have time to work on that many different sign up bonuses. And he likes that Amex doesn't have a credit limit on him. So he's like, I can just keep buying shoes and selling shoes. And he's earning millions of points, obviously not making millions of profit most of the time, but I mean, a few hundred thousand is not a bad profit margin at all. Yeah, not at all. And I think that is such a good point because I think that especially on the business side, sometimes there's an assumption that if you have high expenses, then you must also have really high profit. You must have a high amount of money that you're taking home as the business owner that you can then spend on travel or whatever else. And sometimes that's true. But I think especially for businesses that are in their first couple of years of starting up, that's not necessarily true where what you're investing into your business or what your business expenses are can be significantly higher than what your bottom line profit that you're taking back out of the business. And that's why I think, oh my gosh, especially for business owners, if you have any expenses at all, 
you really are missing out so much if you are not taking advantage of some of these rewards credit cards to be able to earn points for that. Like I remember when I had first joined the medical practice I was in, it was a small physician owned practice. There were four physicians who owned the whole practice and there were about eight of us, eight physicians total. And so we would have meetings where we would just go through and say like, okay, well, what are the expenses right now? What are we spending on these main categories to run the business, to run the laboratory? And I was learning on my own free time about points and miles. And I remember they would talk about like their monthly bills of hundreds of thousands of dollars. Like we need to buy this new machine for the laboratory. The machine is $400,000 and all of the expenses that just go into running a medical practice. And I just remember thinking, you guys could be earning millions of points, right? I mean, they had one bank attached credit card that didn't earn anything, right? Like there was no cash back, <laughs> there were no rewards, nothing. And I remember sitting in on these meetings and just thinking, this is such a huge lost opportunity, right? And so you don't need to have a business that's got millions of dollars in expenses to be able to really leverage them. But certainly if you're a business owner of any type, I mean, you have so much opportunity to earn points. Yeah, a lot of the big points will come from those business credit cards anyway. And like we mentioned earlier in the show, you don't have to be optimizing every single piece of this for points and miles. If you're already working on optimizing your business, which of course you should be if it's your livelihood, then this is just the cherry on top of all of that. We like to say that you should focus on real money before fake money because so many people kind of put the cart before the horse and really focus on how do I earn the most points and miles. It makes them spend more money than they normally would have or you're making all of these weird decisions just in order to chase a few more points or to chase a flight deal or something which might not be the best decision in the long run for the rest of how you live your life. So we do like to say that if you are just focused on optimizing your business, this is just like one extra piece where you're getting it extra on top of everything else. And if you are scaling your business and have it even linked up to one or two good miscellaneous spend credit cards, that will cover in itself. You don't have to be opening tons of cards and adding one more thing to your busy to-do list. Yeah, I completely agree with you. I think, again, for those of us who really love this hobby, of course, like it makes us really excited to find great deals or it makes us really excited when you find that opportunity to earn a lot of points for a certain expense or you learn about an award sweet spot and you're able to redeem your points for 15 cents per point. Like all of that is super fun and you can still do amazing things with points without that being the scenario for you all the time. Like what I see is so many people, again, only because they have never been introduced to this world, they do things with their points because they don't realize there are other options, right? Like they only redeem them for gift cards through their credit card issuer, or they only redeem their points through their credit cards travel portal, which are not horrible things to do, right? But they are missing some potential opportunities. But also it's like, just because a 20 cents per point redemption value opportunity exists, that doesn't mean that anytime you're not getting that, right? Like you're failing at points or you're not getting something valuable to you. I think once you kind of understand, oh, these are different ways I can earn points. Here's the range of ways that I could use them. Once you have that knowledge, then I think at that point, like the best use of points is the one that makes you happy. And sometimes it's some crazy, sexy redemption. And sometimes it's just like a last minute flight that you weren't expecting to take that you don't want to pay cash for. And so thank goodness you have the points for it, right? Like not every single redemption needs to be a headline that you would post on the internet. You can still use points in a way that's really, really valuable for you. I love that. And with everything that you've learned in your decade or so is experience with points and miles and everybody who you've helped on Facebook and everything else, what would you say is your number one piece of advice that you would give to listeners today that we can fit onto an Instagram quote card? Yes, I tell so many people, if you are a high earner or if you have high expenses, that your expenses are assets, okay? Once you learn how to leverage them, you can travel the world with them. So stop looking at your expenses like they're these dirty little things or things that you just have to put up with to run your life, your expenses are assets. They're so valuable. Love it. And speaking of great advice, can you give a shout out to somebody else on the internet who you would recommend that listeners follow for even more points and miles tips? Yes. So I actually have two people because when I was originally thinking about this, I wanted to give a shout out to Nicole, Nicole's travel tips. 
And then you had her on the podcast. And I was thinking, oh my gosh, I was going to shout out Nicole and, and here she is on your podcast. And so she is amazing. And I still want to shout her out. But I also want to shout out someone who I don't think has been on your podcast. And that is Noemi Mendoza. You can find her on Instagram at travel with Noemi. So go and check out both of those amazing ladies. Fantastic. And where can we find you on the internet? Yeah, absolutely. As I mentioned, I'm 42, which means I'm a little bit of a technology and internet troglodyte. And I do not have a huge Instagram presence. I do not consider myself to be an influencer or a content creator, but I am slowly learning Instagram. So you can find me there at point me to underscore first class. And then you can also find me. I have a very old and traditional website. It's point me to first class.com. And I also have a podcast you can find Point Me to First Class in case you want to hear stories, interviews, just more travel tips. You can always find me at the podcast as well. Perfect. Well, thank you so much, Devin, for coming on to the show and talking with us about how people who have higher incomes and higher expenses think about points and miles because it is a little bit of a completely different game there. So super interesting topic. Great conversation. Thank you so much for coming on to the show. Thank you for having me. It's so much fun to talk to you. Thank you so much for listening to today's episode of the GeoBreeze Travel Podcast. If any of the cards mentioned in today's episode piqued your interest, please check out the links in the show notes for more information on any of the cards. Also, if you apply for a card using the links on that page, I may receive a commission too, so please and thank you. P.S. I hear the links work better in Internet Explorer or Safari, and sometimes the credit card applications tend to glitch out in Chrome. Additionally, it would mean the world to me if you could subscribe to this podcast leave a five-star review, and share it with a friend. And if you would like to make even more travel hacking friends, please sign up for the Patreon to access our monthly masterclass hangouts. We dive deep into a particular points program each month, and you'll get to ask all of your travel hacking questions and enjoy being around other people who enjoy points and miles just as much as you and I do. If you would like an invite to the next one, head over to geobreezetravel.com hangouts to sign up to be on the invite list. Take care and happy travels!